First of all, thank you for Dr. Bishop for what's a marvelously informative. and amazingly clear talk, just beautiful. Uh, our custom is to allow the other panelists to have the first opportunity to ask questions. So, do we have anyone on the panel with a question at this point? Dr. Callahan. Uh, I remember back in the 1970s sometimes, the famous physician, uh, writer, Lewis Thomas, proclaimed the end of infectious disease and we were soon conquer the diseases of aging. Uh, of course, that didn't happen. He died of cancer. I guess my, my question is, uh, what are we supposed to learn from evolution? It would seem to me with the difficulty with cancer, the diseases of aging, is we seem to be actually fighting evolution, which appears to want us dead sooner or later. And uh, the question is, and it seems to be a fundamental question, is to what extent should that process go on? Should we resist is it a lesson to be learned from evolution, or can we ignore the lesson, even if it's there? Well, well there are many lessons to be learned from evolution. Uh, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but mm -hmm. I think it's generally agreed that the mm -hmm. central tenet of evolutionary, quote, the theoretical part, is that evolution doesn't care how long we live. They care, mm -hmm. It cares how well we reproduce. Mm -hmm. And once we reproduce, we're left to our own devices. <laughs> Uh, so the interesting question becomes, is that genetic, I, I took the line out of my talk. There was a line in my talk which says there, there's literally a genetic program for aging. That's a misapprehension, actually, I think. These genes are there to serve other purposes. Uh, they're there to sustain a vital organism uh, so that it can reproduce. And once it's through the reproductive age, evolution hasn't done a thing to protect us against type 2 diabetes, for example which is a disease of the, of the aging. Nor has it done a whole lot to protect us against cancer, which is primarily a disease of the aging. So uh, the lesson we learned from evolution, uh, I think, is simply that uh, if we're going to uh, do things to the human organism that would extend its reproductive uh, life, then we have to think very seriously about the species, but I worry less about the impact on the evolution of the human species than I worry about the impact on our society of some of the things I talked about near the end. And incidentally, Lewis Thomas made a lot of predictions that were wrong, <laughs> and it also illustrates some of my own fundamental beliefs, which I violated a couple times this morning. Scientists should not make predictions. <laughs> Any others? Dr. Osterholm. Thank you. It, uh, in, in the terms that you laid out today, it's uh, exciting on, from the standpoint of thinking of immortality or the potential thereof. And uh, it's, it's ironic coming from the medical profession as you do that the one thing that's really given, and I guess depending on your religious beliefs, this has been true, that death is inevitable. Death is going to be an eventual outcome. Everyone in this room will die one day. Given that, I, I, I would like you maybe to think about or to respond to the issue that, in fact, we're trying to avoid death at the cost of possibly creating a different death that may be much worse than the death we might otherwise have anticipated, meaning the top ten causes of death exist today. If we eliminate them, there will be ten new ones. And I'm not so sure some of the new ones aren't going to be a lot worse than the ones we have now. How do you see the construct of genetic engineering, that whole issue you're talking about, playing into that discussion of maybe it is our time, maybe it is the way we want to go, and therefore we shouldn't monkey with it? Uh, I have my own reservations about monkeying with it. That, that's why I raised the issue at the end in a very telegraphic way. Do we really want to interfere with the natural human cycle of youth, uh, reproductive life, and, and aging? Uh, because we don't know what would lie ahead if we uh, extend our lifespan so dramatically. But of course, uh, we're doing that now. Um, the incidence of the mortality rate from cardiovascular disease is dropping uh, uh, fairly dramatically and will probably continue to do so uh, in a gradual way. And uh, we do really do see the prospect of both being able to more effectively treat and eventually prevent uh, the major cancer killers, which is the second most common killer 
in the developed world. So we're going to face that uh, under current circumstances, and so we're going to have a population that is uh, increasingly aging into the range of senility. Now, one thing I didn't uh, mention about, well, I didn't mention it, but I didn't uh, extrapolate. Uh, and th this, of course, is highly speculative. So much of this, I just wanted to illustrate the possible prospects that the genomic error raises. Um, the worm and the fruit fly, although it's not easy to assess their quality of life, there are certain features of them, uh, certain properties that uh, designate their aging. You can tell. If you take a random population of these old earthworms, you can tell the ones that are aging and nearing death. And manipulating these aging genes, the animals that live longer do not display those uh, properties of impending death until very close to death. They remain properties of impending death. And, and very recently, there's been some work, just one paper or two papers so far published in the journal Nature, which clearly link uh, cancer with the aging program. And so the, the thought is that it's a very provisional thought that if you, if you were to extend lifespan in a certain way, you could do it without these uh, uh, dreadful aspects uh, that we associate with, uh, without premature aging, if you will, what would become premature aging. But it's, we just don't know enough to even uh, to answer your question with any assurance. It's clearly on our minds, uh, and uh, uh, I think we have quite a bit of time yet to think about it, frankly. Dr. West? A question from the audience here. Uh, is 30,000 genes enough to code for a human being? Besides multifactorial inheritance and multiple protein encoding, is there another source for biological variability? Uh, well, I mentioned the epigenome, which is a very dramatic source for biological vari uh, variation uh, that we don't fully understand yet, but it's, it's going to greatly increase uh, the capacity for diversification of the genetic program, of expression of the genetic program. Uh, we're also coming upon other features of the genetic apparatus that are totally unanticipated. Uh, so the, the, the simplest answer to your question is, yeah, 30,000 genes is not enough. It confounded people, absolutely puzzled them when it was first discovered. But bit by bit, we're finding it's only, the, it's only part of the story. So uh, in essence, the puzzle of where our complexity, how our complexity arises, is unsolved. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, if we target adult stem cells that may be cancerous or precancerous, what about the susceptibility to normal adult stem cells? Might they also be susceptible? Well, no, not if we're using targeted therapy. It's the same principle I illustrated for you uh, with those four examples. Uh, the, the, the cancer stem cell in principle, and again, this is provisional, but we have good evidence for it in leukemia. The cancer stem cell is different than the normal adult stem cell. It's carrying at least, if not one, if not more than one genetic abnormality. And just as with the mature tumor cell, the, the, the idea is to develop therapies that attack the genetic abnormality in the cancer stem cell, the adult and not the normal adult stem cell. So it's the same principle, just applied to the cancer stem cell rather than to the mature cancer cell. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Your lecture focused heavily on the genetic components of cancer and cancer treatment. Can you comment on the immune system research being conducted uh, as both a causative agent and potential disease therapy? Uh, the only role the immune system plays that we know, certainly, can play in the genesis of cancer is when it is deficient. Uh, and I can illustrate that with patients uh, who are immunosuppressed because they've received transplanted organs. They are susceptible to certain tumors that are caused by viruses. And they're susceptible because their immune system is not counteracting the viral infection. One of these is uh, forms of lymphoma that are caused by a virus called Epstein-Barr virus that many of us are carrying in our cells for the rest of our lives. And it doesn't bother us, but if our immune system is suppressed, 
uh, then this virus can cause lymphoma in a certain number of us. The other example is Kaposi's uh, sarcoma, uh, which occurs mainly in patients with the AIDS, and because the immunosuppression of those patients has affected the ability of a certain herpes virus uh, to infect them and elicit this tumor. Same thing is true of cancer of the cervix, which is uh, the incidence of cancer of the cervix is elevated in uh, women with AIDS, and that's because cervix, cancer of the cervix is caused by infection with a papillomavirus, uh, and these individuals are more susceptible to the infection and the consequences of the infection uh, because their immune system is suppressed. Using the immune system as a therapeutic has been a, a dream for five generations. And until now, it doesn't approach a practical reality. I think that's all I need to say about it. It's still under avid, it makes the press about once a year, use the same two or three people with yet another way to do it, but it is, doesn't approach a practical reality. Okay, so another question. Are disease-bearing genes present for a reason? Will elimination of these genes possibly have a deleterious effect? I would think that's unlikely. Uh, they're not that common. There's no evidence they've been selected for. In fact, there's, we, from, the, from their rarity in the human population, it would appear that they've been counter-selected. So I doubt very much uh, that uh, eliminating these genes is going to have anything but a beneficial uh, effect. And let me repeat that we can eliminate this kind of gene in ways that are, uh, for much of our population, entirely acceptable. Because it, it's done, uh, it's already done, uh, by as part of what's called uh, uh, pre-implantation diagnosis. Uh, if a fertilization is done in vitro, as in assisted reproduction, when little embryos reach the size of about eight cells, this has been in the press recently because people are making stem cells, trying to make stem cells this way too now. But anyway, when the embryo reaches about eight cells, uh, the reproductive scientist or physician just takes one of those cells and can do the diagnostic test to look for hemophilia gene if hemophilia is in the family. And if, if, if it's present and it's acceptable to the parents, that embryo can be discarded and another one tested until one is found that doesn't have the deleterious gene. So that's already uh, a practice, pre-implantation diagnosis. Uh, so, so to repeat, uh, if, you look, if you look at all of the evidence, it would appear that disease genes like that have been counter-selected rather than positively selected. There are a few exceptions. Um, for example, there are certain uh, blood diseases, uh, well, the um, best being sickle cell anemia, that provides some uh, protection against malaria infection and indeed the frequency of that disease is of, of um, sickle cell is higher in areas where malaria infection is endemic. But we have ways to get rid of malaria if we were just willing to apply them universally and bear the expense. And then I believe probably that there would be no further uh, selection on advantage to having sickle cell anemia. It's a dreadful disease and uh, it's been counter-selected in those populations that don't have to bear a malarial burden. Dr. Osterholm, did you? No, actually, I, the comment that Dr. Bishop just made about a good example of sickle cell and malaria, there are those very rare instances where a deleterious gene does have a benefit, and, and part of our job is going to be understanding when that occurs, but I agree with him. It's a very, very rare situation, and it usually is an evolutionarily evident kind of gene situation. But let me point out that all of this, your questioning and the answers, indicates how how even in, in the consideration of disease and disease susceptibility, something that seems so pragmatic, evolution, the existence of evolution and our understanding of evolution is so important as a theoretical underpinning. There's a wonderful book written, I, you may remember, Jim, about uh, the evolution of disease uh, and, and the role of evolution in generating disease and, and preventing it. Uh, it. Evolution underpins everything in biology and biomedicine. Uh, I think it was Dobzhansky who once said that, uh, that you can't think about biology without, uh, without thinking about evolution. It's just impossible now. And in fact, just one follow-up on that. When you think about it, if you trace back our human ancestry, we go back about 80,000 generations to the caves. And throughout that time, many evolutionary selections occurred 
that were related largely to a world of infectious diseases, a life expectancy of less than 40. And it's only been in the last really 100 years that we've had this major change in who we are as humans. And yet that program has already been there. And I think that what Dr. Bishop is really pointing out to us is very important, that in fact we're monkeying with a lot of history that we don't really understand yet that occurred for a very specific reason. And now it's our job to figure that out, even though we live in a world very different than we did even 5, 10, or 15 generations ago. Well, I think it's about time to give one last round of applause for our panelists, <laughs> Dr. Bishop. We will break for lunch, and we will re reassemble here at 1 o'clock.